Back in the 1990s, as I've said in a couple of my videos, I was a seminarian for a time with the Legionaries of Christ in Rome and in other countries in Spain, uh, Mexico, Poland, East, um, Eastern Europe. But uh, I did my novitiate in uh, Italy, in Northern Italy, in Como um, near Luga and near Lugano. And um, then went on to do studies in Rome, uh, some humanities in Spain. Uh, so uh, a, a beautiful time, to be honest, beautiful forma formation. I know I know. afterwards uh, it became one of the biggest scandals in the church when the founder, uh, and I need say no more to anybody who knows the history, but my experience was positive. Uh, the people that I met were positive. But I remember... Uh, I remember an interesting fact that, that happened to me when I was studying philosophy in Rome. There was a priest, an American priest, with the exact same name as myself, Father Robert Nugent. Now, he was a lot older than me. We're not, as far as I know, we're not direct relations. Uh, he, he, uh, and I never met him. But in the, in the 1990s, he came under a lot of scrutiny in the Vatican, under the papacy of John Paul II. And he was censored uh, and ultimately he had to stop ministering. Uh, he was part of the New Ways ministry. And this has been an incredible, you know, the amount of discussion that's gone on in the church. You could fill volumes at the moment. Uh, and, and it all came to the fore lately in the Synod on Synodality when Pope, John Paul, uh, Pope Francis brought in Sister uh, Gramic uh, from New Ways Ministries uh, and brought her in and re has really rehabilitated New Ways Ministries in the church. So over the years, I've been following this debate, this saga, for, for many different reasons. I vividly remember in the 1990s, vividly remember, there were some incidences in Rome where it's, when Father Robert Nugent would come out in the Observatory Romano, you know, you'd often get the comment, oh, Robert, I, we see you've been censored. <laughs> and uh, I was, I, I remember once being in the, in the Vatican in the Secretary of State. You, and if you, if you have to go into, I mean, to go into St. Peter's, it's different. But if you're going into, going up the escalators or anywhere up in official offices where, where cardinals work you you have to have like a slip a piece of paper and you and you and you kind of you're showing this paper as you're moving through the Vatican but I vividly remember I don't know why it was there was I with some other brother or something like that we were getting something done in in the Secretary of State or some some office that's in the Vatican uh, you know to the to the right of St. Peter's uh, going up there so um and uh i had to fill in you have to fill in your details your name blah 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 and i remember uh i remember the brother was doing my permission slip for whatever reason he was filling it in and he put in the name and he was handing it to whoever was organizing the admin and uh the guy that was doing it he turned to the brother and said Questo Robert Nugent, uh, e lui quel americano che il papa ha detto blah, blah, blah. And I remember the other brother saying, oh, no, 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 lui, lui, no, no, lui neanche sacerdote. He's not even a priest. Uh, lui, lui irlandese, he's, he's Irish. And I was there just listening to the, to the conversation that the two are having about me. <laughs> and I spoke Italian and understood Italian. And... Uh, Va bene, va bene. Um, so, you know, you could, the, uh, because I'm sure if the real Rob, Father Robert Nugent had turned up in the Vatican, he certainly wouldn't be getting a permission slip to go up to the Secretary of State. It, it wouldn't have happened. Um, but, you know, I was caught in the fray because I shared the same name um, as Ro Father Robert Nugent. Simple as. That's that's kind of... And, Back in back when I was in my twenties, I used to suffer from from anxiety like you would not believe. I used to be so anxious; it used to destroy me. And so, any of these incidents, I used to go deeply embarrassed, red. You know, it just was uh, was it was very difficult. You know, when people would make jokes about you know you know the normal banter, 
I just couldn't take it sometimes, the banter and stuff like that. So I used to be very self-conscious. But, um, you know, over the um, over the years, you know, you, you, as, as I as I get older, I do reflect reflect back in those days. And, you know, in 1999, somebody very close to me, very close to me. And I don't want to this blog is not about him. It's about my it's my own blog. And so I don't really want to disclose personal details of other people. But somebody very close to me, they came out and said, well, look, he, he is gay. And um, I remember it had a deep impact on me. So how am I going to deal with this? I'm I'm a Catholic seminarian. Um, you know, how do we grapple with this? How do you grapple with this? Because as as Catholics, as Catholics, you know, when you're trying to teach somebody or give them the Catholic faith, you can't just run into a room and shove this book in their face. And now you live that. And unless you live that, don't come to, to church. Don't come uh, to prayer here. We don't want to see you type thing. Until you're perfect as a man, don't come looking for uh, sacraments in the church. Until you're perfect. Until you're wed, re willing to accept. And uh, oftentimes, we look at one part of their life. One part of their life. And forget all of the other layers of that person that has that all of the other layers of that person so you could have a gay man that's also a drug addict or a gay man that's also suffering from trauma or or other issues it's never i mean i've yet to meet a perfect man that doesn't have one or other trauma in their life in the sense you know we're we're, we're all work in progress and uh it, you know you, you at the one hand you're, you love the faith and the other hand, you're trying to speak into the world of today. You're speaking to the world of today. Because what will happen, you know, in the church, if you're feeling ostracized or othered or you're made to feel shame because gay men have made to feel ashamed, shame. You know, they're, they, they, they have made to feel like you have to feel shame for what you've experienced. And that's not right. We never do that. But that's how they felt. You know, they felt ashamed for simply saying what they were experiencing. Not, I'm not saying that what they, the acts, we're not talking here about acts. We're, we're talking about what they, through no fault of their own, experienced. They felt shame. And when they tried to voice or look for support to talk it out in the church, they were felt, they were made to feel more shame. And then you go to, for example, they go into a gay bar and, and everybody says, no, you don't have to be shamed. You sit down here. We'll hear. We'll love you. You're, you're one of us. Don't worry. So, of course, where do, where, 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 do we, where do we go in the church? One side will say, be proud of yourself. The other side, oftentimes, and this is the hard truth reality of it. The other side in the church would say, be ashamed of yourself. That's the truth. That's that's especially in the 1980s. Now, I know the church has changed and it has come on leaps and bounds over the last 20 years um, in, in trying to manage this area. But um, and it, there's a lot more work that's needed in this area. But there are there are nuances in this that, you know, you have to sit down and, and think about because as 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 um, as Catholics, we have to bring. We have to show the great love of our Lord that is capable of changing our mind and the way we see life. And sometimes that takes patience and time. It takes patience and time to walk with somebody. If you were walking with an alcoholic, you know, it will take patience and time. And so when they fall off the wagon, you don't go back and make them feel ashamed. You say, okay. What happened? Why did you fall off? Why did you drink? What led you to drink? Um, okay, so that trigger here. Look, we, we'll help you with this. Maybe we'll, we'll you, you know, in, include you more in a prayer group. Do this. We don't make them feel ashamed. Uh, you know, we in general in the church, we, we try not to do this because that isn't going. That's a blocker. That's a spiritual blocker. If you're constantly feeling shame. You're never going to the healing can't come in to heal you you know 
We have to remove these spiritual blockers, shame, resentment, fear, anxiety, all of these things in order to allow healing into that into that man's or woman's life. And it, and it has to be done with skill and delicacy. And so we've seen the three papacies here. We've seen John Paul II with uh, and Pope Benedict. And now we have John, uh, Pope Francis, which has caused untold, unprecedented level of discussion in this area. You know, voices that in, in previous times in the church would simply not be heard in the church. At this time of the church, Pope Francis has said, you know, you're 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 allowed to talk. He's given say he's he's saying he's passed the the, the speaking the speaking um, uh, rule to them. And he said, now you're allowed to talk. And this has caused a massive debate. And in the middle of this. He said, I'm not changing church teaching. That is what Pope Francis has literally quoted many times. I'm not changing church teaching. But many people have accused him. You're okay. You're not changing church teaching. You're just not being clear on it anymore. It's caused a lot of debate. In the midst of all of this, you have certain, you have people in this world that have a right to know Christ. That have a right to be ministered by priests in the church. And we hold uh, Father uh, Damiano, you know, uh, who went and ministered to the lepers. In the same way, there are certain people that have a, have a spiritual leprosy that some people in the church just will not touch. I'm not touching him. I'm not going to minister to that person. And I, and I, and I think, you know, the church needs to be very careful in this area, you know, because sometimes... We can be so focused on it that we forget the soul there that needs to know Christ. And that's kind of my reflection over the last 25 years on seeing that phenomenon back in the 1990s being sense, mistakenly censored, you might say, by the Vatican uh, in the sense that, you know, <laughs> trying to make sure that I wasn't that other fella, that American fella that had been censored. Um. And, you, and I've seen, you know, the Pope, the church grappling with this and trying to minister to a, 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 a group that is often on one side of the church vilified. You know, unless you live this, your abomination, you're this, you're that, you're the other, you're going to hell. And many of them have been in hell already. You know, many of them have suffered through abuse, horrible abuse. So when they when they hear what is being said about them, do you know what happens to some gay men because of what we the 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 rhetoric and the tone and the discussion and the voices? Do you know what happens to some Catholic gay, gay men? They stop listening, and they convince themselves that that the Catholic that God doesn't exist, and they will avoid anything to do with the Catholic Church. That is what has happens. You know, you you're you're um, you're this, you're that, you're. Uh, and you, and you hear this 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 tone and they will just they will just make sure that they have nothing at all whatsoever to do with the catholic church so you can't even m invite them to a prayer service or something like that they'll say no no you're all hip they'll say it to me because i've had this discussion you're hypocrites you're there telling me about my life and look at McCarrick. you're ter you're there telling me about my life and look at all the child abuse in the church you know, don't come to me with, on, with your moral high ground saying this, that and the other. Because, you know, they, they, they've convinced themselves that there is no truth in our faith. And they will have no engagement with it whatsoever. And it's very, very, very sad. And, um, you know, that's why when I, when I see Pope Francis and I see and I'm seeing following the discussion both sides on both sides. Um, and uh, followed it during the Synod, you have to tiptoe which we have to listen in a different way in the church. You have to listen in a different way. Or otherwise, how are we supposed to evangelize in this world? How are we supposed to? And at the same time, we, don't, we have to be, be careful that this whole phenomenon, the, the rainbow washing of the church, doesn't destroy, doesn't destroy the, the very fabric of the church. You know, because there is a militant side of this. It's an uber religion now in the world that if you voice and say, well, I don't think kids should be given 
uh, hormones to stop puberty. I don't think that that's right. When you voice an opinion to say, well, I don't think thousands of kids should be given hormones to stop puberty. I don't think that that's the correct. You're, 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 you're shouted down as this, you're anti this, you're, 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 and I said, no, I'm not anything anti. I'm just saying voicing the fact that this isn't, that this phenomenon is, is a global, is a global danger to the health of our children. And so on the one side, how you minister, and the other side, how you confront an ideology that is literally the uber religion filtered through all society and governments and NGOs and all of this, if you don't accept this. And, uh, you know, I just thought it's it's something that, that requires more discussion in in the church. And it will require open discussion. You know, how do we evangelize in this world? Because just leaving them to one side and saying, no, just when you accept the Catholic faith, start to finish every single uh, dot on the eye, everything, then you come in here, we'll start ministering to you. And until you're perfect, don't come into the church. Please, just, just stay away. And, okay, that's one side of the church. And then the other side of the church, you have the one side, then the other side of the church, no, you don't need to change. Just come in as you are. We accept you as you are, what you're doing. Don't worry about that. You come in here and, you know, come as you are and uh, you don't need to change. You know, we have to pose a challenge to everybody, you know, equally. We have to pose the Christian challenge to every human being equally and saying this is the truth. So for some of you, it will take you 10 or 20 years to come to understand it. And for some of you, it might take you five or years or one year or so forth but this is the truth this is the person that we're we're offering you and we align our our mind our intellect and our heart to this to this truth that and it's 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 an encounter of love remember the catholic faith is an encounter of love that 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 draws us into the unity of christ's sacred heart and his spirit and that's a beautiful thing now if, if people met christ if you met Christ, and I get a lot of criticism for even saying this, that that faith is in, as an encounter. And I get all these quotes from the Council of Trent and traditional catechisms. Do you accept this, Robert? Do you accept that, Robert? Or what are you saying? I said, of course I accept the Council of Trent and all of this and all of that. But I don't believe in a paragraph in a book. I don't believe in, in a set written statement. In the sense that that, I don't put my faith in something, in that, that thing. I don't I'm want to say something here. My faith isn't in a book or a text. It's not in this. It's in a person. And through him, I believe what he says. And I'll align my life to what he says. You know, his word in the gospel. I'll believe it. You know. And he'll, he'll change my mind. It'll change how I act in my life, how I think. You know, 20, 30 years ago, extremely, extremely anxious. Unbelievably anxious. I mean, oh God, it was it was it was petrifying sometimes. You you'd be there, you'd be just uh, you know, uh, you, this uh, existential this anxiety of life. I just couldn't um I don't know. And, and and today, you know, to, to, to live without that is, oh, thank God that that's a lot of these things in my life are gone. And so that's what I'm trying to, to, to present to the church in the sense that we need to step into the encounter with Christ. And we need to lead other people into to the encounter with Christ. And we would evangelize a lot better as a church if we were just authentic and vulnerable, authentic real about ourselves we would evangelize and bring okay this is what the lord the lord did for me this is what he is doing for me now i understand because if you're there with a person in your life and he's leading you and he's helping you and he's talking to you and he's encouraging you and he's speaking to you in the in the gospel which he does you know you know that that's a real you know the words in the gospel are actually re real words you know that christ actually actually um rose from the dead you know that that 
our Lord appeared to, to those in uh, walking to Emmaus. That actually happened. And he's actually alive today. And you can actually bring people to talk to him. And he'll actually explain to you how to view life in a different way. And that's where we need to bring people to. You know, if we're not doing that in the church, we're we're actually we're actually following maybe maybe an ideology instead of understanding who Christ is and how he is working. And every everybody has the right to know Christ. You know, so on one side in the church, when Pope Francis says, Who am I to judge? and he's reached out to certain people that, that were have been ostracized and never ministered to do to. You know, they're cheering him on and we're looking at this. Well, hold on a second. In the last two papacies, all you crowd were silenced. And all of a sudden you're there very happy with this new papacy. Okay. You know, is Pope Francis doing everything right? No, but like at the end of the day, we have to recognize everybody has a right to, to, to encounter Christ. And we have to work with patience humility authenticity of our own lives to bring them into that encounter with christ and if we're not if we don't do that we're failing them and i suppose i just want to go back to the fact you know it's sometimes you need to sit down and listen to their experiences just sit listen to their to their pain you know a man that comes out and he says he's gay and then the family doesn't want anything to do with them the whole family is traumatized Okay, and like it's like it's like if, if somebody comes out and says, "Well, I'm autistic. I'm autistic. I've been diagnosed with autism." The family say, "Okay, well, well, you've you've lived up to now. Actually, look, it's just autism. You know, there wouldn't be massive amount of discussion. You know, especially an adult who says, "Look, I've been diagnosed." Well, that kind of explains a bit about your life. Now we understand you. You weren't really very sociable. You were always this. You were always that. You know what I mean? It wouldn't be much of a trauma. It wouldn't drive much discussion in the family, to be honest. You know, it wouldn't. Or somebody comes out with some other dyslexia that I suffer from. Um. You know, you come out and say it. Oh, OK, well, that explains you can never write really well. And you were always this and you were always that. OK, well, people make allowances for for their way of, of acting. Of, 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 you know, if somebody is, is, is autistic, you know, you make allowance for. OK, you are autistic. I know. I, and now I can I can understand. And now I can speak in a way that that that, that person can understand. We can. I understand that the eye contact would will be different, or maybe sensory issues or something like that. You know, there's a number of things that that impact people's lives that we make allowances for. Now, I'm, and in no way am I saying here that I rejecting the, the 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 teachings of the church, but somebody, you know, we have to we have to work with how their life is in order to bring healing into their life and understand, them. and most importantly not make them feel shame not make them sh feel shame because that's the, the worst thing you can do and that's what happens somebody says something to them and they're made feel shame and they say and and, and that oh my god that is like just another nail into their lives that's the truth of it you how how are you going to bring healing and help and support for that person if you make them feel shame and they do they say it well I came out and I told my family this and these are people that weren't with sleeping with anybody or in any relationship how, hold on a second sure how are you going to help that person and oftentimes it's not the one issue it could be this issue, it could be that issue, or a series of another another issues. And the church has to has to work in some way to have a ministry that is able to help them where they are. You know, to get in and work where they are, which is going to re require a lot of a, a, a lot of um you know 
discussion. And if you can, and, and this discussion is actually happening at this moment in time in the church, and the discussion is very polarizing. It's you know, we've we, we do it one way. I mean, we're doing it another way. The, the discussion will go on, but it's more nuanced than people think. So when you see Fernandez coming out with his document, can can children of transgen or of gay couples be baptized? It's created a whole storm in the church. And the very thing is, OK, you have a, a certain set of questions and now you have to go and apply them to people, you know. So in one parish, you know, the child is uh, is uh, the child of a woman and that woman is living with another woman. OK, do, 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 do you minister to that child? Do you minister to that couple? Do you try and bring the gospel into their lives? Do you, do you, do you actually even approach them? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, in this world, in this moment in time, in, in, in 2023, how do we do it? I, I mean, I, it will go on. I mean, if you're blessed with having the perfect life, God bless you. But there are a lot of people that suffer in this world. That really do suffer. And, you know, they deserve to know the love of Christ. And it will require a lot of prayer and patience and you know it will require a lot of work to actually evangelize in this world it really will in the next couple of years it will require everything every ounce of authenticity of prayer of study to bring the gospel into this world you know we see it in the, in the lives of 500 men every year that take their lives and i say this so many times because i think it's an utter tragedy it's an utter we haven't evangelized we haven't brought anything. What have we done as a church to bring the good news, good news into their lives? What are we doing? And, and so, okay, the Pope is doing, has created a conversation. I've, as I said, thank God for Pope Francis in the way that, you know, he's, 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 he's driven the conversation into the church that Pope Benedict would never have done. And people will criticise him and criticise him and criticise him. All like, okay, okay, okay. But look, look at the result of the McCarrick Report in America. Look at the result of the McCarrick Report. Look at the changes in, in American seminaries. Those are real changes. For the better. You know, American Catholicism is becoming more and more and more and more conservative. You know, and that's it. <laughs> you know, the unintended results of, of this papacy. And so now, I suppose my, my message speaking into this is we need to, we need to go deep into our faith. We need to be saints. We need to know how to pray. We need to go into adoration and, 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 and really have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with our Lord. Lord, how can we evangelize better? Lord, how can we announce your gospel better into this world? How can we bring people to that encounter? Everybody has their anxieties, their, their pains, their sufferings. Some people it's, it's more obvious and some people it's less obvious. Um... It really is. And, you know, and, and, and that's my encouragement. You know, we, we have to meet some people where they are sometimes, not where we expect them to be. You know, OK, you're here. I've some good news to give you that might change your life. You know. And, and give them the entirety of that, that. And that sometimes may mean praying with them as they are, where they are, praying with them. Bring the light of the Holy Spirit into their life. Do you see? And that's why I go back to the faith has to be in an encounter. It has to. It has to be your own. You have to make it your own. It has to be that encounter. Because otherwise, if you're believing just a, a formula of a doctrine... I'm I'm lending my my assent, my intellectual assent to something that I've that 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 I've been, and not realizing okay behind this there is an encounter with an actual living God in the Eucharist. That that is incredible. It is ooh, mind blowing and 
you know, and, and this is what we are, we are failing in the church at this moment in time to bring, to actually show, maybe we don't live it ourselves. And this is what has happened in the church. So many people in the church spoke about Christ without knowing Christ and didn't even have the authenticity of life. Prime example, Father Marcel used to go on for hours about Christ. Never knew him. Never knew him. Never knew him. That's a, That's the truth. From what we can see by the, the way he lived his life. Never knew him. A drug addict. And you know, that's, it's, it's a lesson in the church. This is a lesson for us to, God has a, permitted this to teach us a lesson. You know, we have to be humble. We have to be authentic. We have to live the gospel ourselves. We have to take ownership for our spiritual life in order to, to, to do all the work to allow God workers through us so that we can go out and be as apostles and evangelize in this world, we have to take up that task. You know, don't sometimes we're very quick to point the finger at that one group or person in the church. And are we doing the work ourselves on ourselves? Have I done it? You know, do you take the up the task of 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 frequent confession, of of a spiritual of a spiritual path of perfection. Are we doing that work? Because how can I evangelize in this world if I'm not more or more authentic? You know, if you look at McCarrick, the amount of stuff, on the one hand, he was bedding seminarians, on the other hand, he was saying this, that, and the other. You know, go back on what he said, defending this and defending church teaching. Hold on a second. Do, do we not see how, what a hypocrite he was? And of course, those that reject the Catholic teaching, you're saying, hold on a second, you're, you're, you're coming to me and talking about chastity. Oh, where did you get that chastity? Well, maybe you should stop promoting fellas like him or him or him or him. Look at all these guys who were talking about chastity and accepting this and that and the other. Well, look, look at their double lives. You know, and now it's a, it's a wake up call in the church. We want to take up the task of evangelization. We need to be authentic. And we need to 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 be to to work in the world which we live in, not the world we which we wished we live in. So many people think I'd love to live in the 1950s. They were the glory days before Pope Pius the 12th, Pope Pius the 10th, the glory days of Pope Pius the 10th. When we were during which is his period we were millions and millions and millions of people were were being killed around the world in World War War or Pope Pius the 12th. We live in the world of today and we need to evangelize into the world of today. And that's the challenge. And so, you know, we have the papacy, we have the challenge we have. You know, how do we how do we teach the faith better? And that's my 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 thoughts on this anyway. And I'd like to hear other people's thoughts um, because there's. Remember, at the end of the day. The person who does the evangelization, the, the person that converts hearts, that reaches somebody's heart, is God, is Christ, his spirit. He does that. You know, that's the difference between proselytism and, and evangelization. People are drawn to saints. So, oh my God, you, you seem so authentic. You seem so happy. What do you have? What's that? What's the formula you have in your life? I, I'd really like to... I'd really like some of that, you know. I, I there sometimes I get emails and comments on my channel. People ring me up or say, "Well, I'm not a Catholic, and I've been listening to your videos, and you seem to connect with me. And how do I become Catholic?" I said, "Okay, if you want to become Catholic, and then I'd have my my map of contacts around the world." Uh, I said, "Where where are you located?" Well, I'm here. Okay, well, I would suggest you go to this group or that group or something like that. so I can I get the I get the, the contacts in and then I farm them out to, to 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 priests and lay groups around there and I don't know why people are contacting me and then I say then I have to understand okay it's not Robert Nugent doing that in any way shape or form it is the grace of God it is all his work he's the one that evangelizes you know, all we have to do is give the good news, live the good news, give the good news. That's all he did. We, we just have to do what the gospel says. 
Just do what Christ tells us to do. Do what he says us to tell, love one another as I have loved you. Feed the poor. Do what he says. Do what Christ says. If you're doing what he says and listening to him and walking with him, he'll start to work. He'll start to work. And if we did that as a church, you might be surprised at how the church will be transformed. You know? Um, and, you know, you, people might be surprised how the traditional Latin Mass will suddenly renew in the church in the sense that it will be a beautiful, we will see it as, as just a beautiful jewel of prayer where we can meditate with our Lord and love our Lord in the sense that, you know, it's not used as a political tool in the church anymore, but it's, it's just a beautiful encounter, you know, a divine encounter that we can use to, to, to grow prayer. Um, so, you know, that's my encouragement. And again, I, I'm just, you know, just wanted to, to recount that, that story. But it's something that I've meditated on, you know, how, how do we give the good news into Ireland today? How do we do this? And the more I think about it, there's no point in me pointing fingers at bishops or priests that are not doing it or the Pope or all of this, because I can't change any of those the only, the only person I can change is myself. That's it. You know, if, I, if, you, if you're going to talk about this, you have, to, you have to meditate on it, live it. I can't change anything else. I can only change myself. I can only listen to Christ's voice and to be that flawed work in progress saint. Because that is my only vocation. There, there, there exists no other vocation but the flawed work in progress saint. That is it. And to speak into the lives of people that listen to me, the millions of people that, mi that now listen to my videos, uh, to speak into the lives, to your lives, you're, you're listening on a phone, you're listening on a tablet or wherever you're listening, to know that you're loved unconditionally by God. And he draws you into a change of, of a way of seeing things. And if you work with his grace, cooperate with his grace, he'll change your life. He'll make you see how, you, how your life can be different, greater than your problems, greater than the situation. He'll fill your heart. He'll give you a, a, a love that you have never experienced in your whole life. You know, and um, and again, I go back to that experience that I had when I was 18 that really kept me in the seminary for for longer, because when I went into the seminary first, I didn't really feel like I should be there. I said, no, I'm not called to the seminary. I'm just not. Seminary material, priestly material didn't feel it was uh, never really felt that I was actually going to be a priest, really. But I am. Um, I had that experience very on in the seminary where, you know, I was in prayer and I was saying, well, Lord, do you really love me? Do you really love me? And um, and then I hear an audible voice and it was our Lord saying, of course, I love you, not the interior voice. And it was like my your your my whole self was 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 really it was it was such an encounter. And then afterwards, I'm sitting back. I said, oh, I can't talk about this. Because God doesn't do this to people like me. He does it to all those saints. And you listen to lives of saints and you hear it. But I mean, I'm not a saint. And I, and I knew I wasn't in any shape or form. I said, no, oh, God. So you, 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 just, you just refuse to engage with what Christ is actually saying to you. And you're kind of timid and you're, you're anxious. And you said, no, I, I can't listen. But now when I go back in it, it is the most true, real experience of Christ that I've ever had in my life. It is the the experience of my life because I go back to that and I know it to be true he did he did live he did, does he does feed us in the Eucharist and he transforms our hearts and so I'm encouraging others don't listen to my experience of Christ you go and and have an encounter which is what the Eucharist is an encounter you're not eating a piece of bread. You're encountering personally Christ. And that is the faith of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years. 
It is a heart-to-heart encounter. You're meeting Christ of the gospel, living today. And if we did this, if we showed this to the church, then we'd understand, okay, how Christ's spirit then will, will work in your life to change. He does. Anyway, this went on for longer than I expected. <laughs> and I don't know if many people are going to arrive to minute 40 of this visit video, but I just thought, you know, drive the discussion here on, on this. And you know, I'm encouraging, if you want to evangelize in this world, it will take, you know, we need to step it up. We need to step it up. We need to know the faith, love the faith, live the faith, be authentic. We need authenticity in our preaching. Of course, we're we're sinners. We have our pasts. We've you know we, we're not perfect, but that's that's the what the gospel does. You know, a lot of those people in the gospel they weren't perfect. They meet Christ, and He changes a mind. And He and He makes us. He makes us who we who we who we are today. God bless you. Take care. Bye bye.